The study of individual versus group decision making and problem solving has a long history in the field of psychology. In experiments on this topic, they usually have individuals attempt to solve problems or generate solutions to problems and then compare them with groups doing the same things. And the problems can be very simple, like judging what the room temperature is, judging how much something weighs, uh, judging the number of marbles that are in a jar. Um, and group judgment is usually better than the judgment of most individuals, but not usually better than the judgments of the best individuals. Nevertheless, on most kinds of problem solving, uh, groups produce more solutions and better solutions to problems than do most individuals. And groups are better for a variety of reasons. We're going to focus more on decision making rather than problem solving in this set of PowerPoint slides. It turns out that there are some uh, pitfalls to group decision making, some traps that we need to watch out for uh, to make sure that groups don't make bad decisions. And I'm going to describe the most common of these right now. Let me start with something that's known as group polarization. Folklore has it that group decisions will be more conservative than individual decisions. When I was a student, though, and I started learning about the early research on group decision making, uh, I studied something that came to be known as the risky shift. Early laboratory studies on group decision making surprisingly found that groups made riskier decisions than most individuals did on their own. Later on, though, we found out that what's going on isn't really a risky shift as much as what we call a group shift or group polarization. What's really going on is that the group deliberations enhance whatever the original inclinations of most of the people in the group were. And they do studies on uh, military and student groups, uh, mock juries, and they all find pretty much the same things. When uh, most of the individuals in a group are inclined toward, let's say, a liberal decision, the group decision will turn out to be even more liberal than the decisions of, that most of the individuals would have made. On the other hand, if the group was leaning in a conservative direction, the group decision will end up being even more extremely conservative than the decisions that would have been made by most of the individuals working on their own. So in group decisions, a group polarization means the group moves further out to the extreme whichever direction that extreme is based on the original inclinations of the members. And it seems like there are a variety of reasons why group polarization occurs. First of all, people hear new arguments for their original point of view, and so they become even more confident and more willing to be extreme than they um, would have been originally. And uh, we like to look good and be admired by other group members and for some reason, we tend to admire those that are more extreme than ourselves. So when you are in a group and you see other people taking more extreme positions than you on a position you believe, uh, you're going to tend to move in that direction as well. Let me skip over groupthink for a moment and talk about the other two. And then we'll come back and discuss groupthink a little bit. Uh, the escalation of commitment to bad decisions, sometimes known as the knee-deep in the big muddy situation. Um, this is something that not only groups do, individuals do this as well. It's kind of like throwing good money after bad. When you get negative feedback about a previous decision, there's a strong tendency to commit even money, more money, more time, more resources to this failing course of action. If you've ever had an old car that you keep sinking money into to get it fixed, uh, it becomes pretty clear after a while that you should just get rid of the car because it isn't any good. But you've already sunk so much money into it that you feel the need to follow that up with even more because otherwise you feel like you've lost the money. Or if you've ever stood in the rain for a long time waiting for a bus, well, you could have walked to where you were supposed to be by now, but you'll continue to stand there because you've already invested that much time. So we commit more to a failed decision than rational uh, observers would think that we should. This happens in groups as well with even more vigor. Groups tend to enhance this escalation of commitment uh, even beyond what individuals would do on their own. 
Another problem um, with groups is that people like to interact with each other and they can get distracted from the task. There's something known as the common knowledge effect where if you're in a group of people and you're working on some kind of decision making, you spend too much time talking to each other about things you all already know, common knowledge. And this uh, kind of sidetracks you from addressing the issue at hand, which is making a decision. So let's come back to the topic of groupthink. This is one of the most insidious of all of the obstacles that groups throw in the way of good decisions. Groupthink is a phenomenon that occurs in a highly cohesive decision-making group where the members of the group are so preoccupied with maintaining group consensus that their critical abilities become ineffective. In other words, if you're in a highly cohesive group, there's pressure on you to create a united front and this impairs your ability to think about things as thoroughly as you should. There are many famous examples of groupthink in operation. Uh, one of the more recent ones is the decision to invade Iraq in 2003. But um, there's a video associated with this part of the course where you can uh, read about the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster, which is now widely regarded as a a tragic example of groupthink in operation. This shy slide is going to show you a list of the most common symptoms of groupthink. Let me put them up on the screen before I talk about them. All right. First of all, the group has an illusion of invulnerability. They're very confident. They feel like they can't possibly be wrong. They think of themselves as smart people. And this blinds you to some of the shortcomings of the things you're thinking of doing. The group usually has shared stereotypes. You're all on the same page about what your adversaries are like and what other people are like. There's an illusion of morality. You feel like God is on your side your group is doing the right thing. You rationalize uh, anything that uh, seems like you maybe you're thinking of doing some kind of unethical thing, but you rationalize that away so that the ends um, justify the means. There's this illusion of unanimity. We think that everybody in the group is on the same page, that we're all in agreement. That may or may not be true, and hence we have strong conformity pressures. So if you're starting to have doubts uh, you kind of keep them to yourself and you go along with the group. When contradictory information does come up, there's some evidence that maybe you're on the wrong track here and that there's a problem with your decision, we tend to minimize it or ignore it altogether. Uh, Self-censorship means you don't speak up when you have doubts. Uh, the group often has uh, somebody in the group that's known as a mind guard, somebody who's very hypervigilant about dissent and is very quick to sort of jump on anybody who expresses doubts or disagreement and tries to quiet them down. If the group also has a leader who has openly promoted a favorite decision, this immediately puts the group on the road uh, toward making a bad decision. There are some well-accepted ways for trying to avoid groupthink. First of all, make sure the leader doesn't share their personal opinions ahead of time. Let the group deliberate. The leader should not exert undue influence by kind of telling the group what conclusion they ought to reach before they even started thinking about it. It can be helpful to divide the large group up into smaller groups. So you have a bunch of smaller groups making their own decisions about the issue. And then you bring them all back together afterwards. And in this situation, you may find that some of the groups have come to different conclusions than others. And this leads to a more productive discussion. Sometimes you can even appoint what's called a designated devil's advocate. There's a person in the group whose job it is to question the conclusions that the group is coming to, to question the evidence that's being presented. And this frees the person from any conformity pressure because everybody knows this individual has been given this job to intentionally try to challenge the decision. So some combination of these things might help the group avoid 
falling into the trap of groupthink. There are some other uh, techniques that have been introduced to help groups make good decisions. Um, brainstorming is one of them. In brainstorming, um, individuals are encouraged to express ideas without regard to their quality. You just throw them out there and you're encouraged to elaborate on other people's ideas, but you're not allowed to sort of poo-poo them or dismiss them or criticize them. Um, brainstorming is widely believed to be very useful, especially as an aid to helping individuals solve problems. However, studies consistently show that um, individuals working alone produce just as many solutions as individuals in brainstorming sessions. And so the actual effectiveness of brainstorming perhaps is overrated. There are famous examples of how well it can work though. For example, many of you may be familiar with Arm & Hammer baking soda. It was around, it has been around for a long time. It was originally used in baking, but also used as an antacid for people with heartburn. But over the years, uh, people had less and less use for it. And it was through a brainstorming session where they discovered that it was actually a very good way of absor absorbing or odors in a refrigerator. Many of you probably have an open box of baking soda in your refrigerators uh, at home. And uh, this is an example of finding a new use for an old product through the process of brainstorming. So it may be effective in some cases, but it's not usually as effective as uh, everybody seems to think. There are other techniques, the nominal group technique. Um, individuals meet as a group and they begin by silently generating their ideas on a problem. And then there's a round robin procedure in which each member presents an idea without discussion. And then these are all signed up summarized. Then they discuss each idea for clarification, but you can't criticize or attack them. And then the group members silently record their rank ordering of ideas. Uh, this is a way of voting on what the best idea is, but freeing people up from the fear of being criticized. The Delphi technique is a technique where the members of the group never actually meet face to face. They find a number of experts on a problem and they send this problem out to each expert. And each expert anonymously records comments, makes suggestions, suggests solutions. And then these are all compiled and sent out to the group. And each expert then comments on the other people's suggestions. And they keep going round after round after round on this. And the bad ideas sort of drop out and a consensus begins to develop about what the best solutions are. So these are just some examples of ways in which uh, people who make decisions in groups have attempted to make sure those decisions are as good as they possibly can be.